Um, welcome back. Welcome to this afternoon session. Um, a very brief introduction of the panel of this afternoon. Uh, on my far left uh, is Andoid Corta. He is a general manager at Corta, a local company, a local, a Spanish company that produces, as I understand it from their website, a particular type of screws, which they sell to major uh, machine tool companies all over the world. So this, I'm, I'm also from our discussion this morning, I think this already um, gives an indication how nice it is to have him on the panel this afternoon. Um, on my left also is Professor Fausto Pocar. Um, I will un introduce him more elaborately just now. Um, first of all, before I get to that, I would like to just quickly say what is uh, on, the, on the agenda for, for this panel. Uh, firstly, we'll hear uh, a perspective of Professor Pokar um, for about 20 minutes, then we'll have room, about 10 minutes, um, of, for questions and discussion with the panel, with the audience, so I uh, heartily invite you to participate in that. Um, after that, we will turn to a discussion of the two cases um, that, were, that are central to this panel. Two cases in which EU corporate defendants uh, have sought to be, in, uh, to be held liable uh, before non-EU courts for um, human rights violations perpetrated in third countries. Um, first, though, we turn to uh, Professor Fausto Picar. Um, Professor Fausto Picar is an Italian law professor, and I'm very honored to introduce you. Um, he is a professor of international law from the University of Milan, uh, where he has also served as the dean of the Faculty of Political Sciences and as the vice rector. Um, but he is also the former president of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. And he currently still serves as a judge uh, in the appeals chamber of the Yugoslavia Tribunal as well as of the Rwanda Tribunal. Um, now, Professor Pogar has a long-standing experience in UN activities, in particular in the field of human rights and humanitarian law. And among other things, uh, he has served as a member and also as the chairman of the Human Rights Committee under the International Covenant uh, on Civil and Political Rights. Um, considering Professor Pokar's illustrious career and his vast experience in the field of human rights law and international criminal law, I think it will be particularly interesting to hear his views on the business and human rights debate. Um, so uh, without further ado, I would like to now um, gladly give the floor to Professor Pokar. Uh, your presentation to which I would only add, uh, just to justify my presence here, maybe, uh, that uh, I, most of my career was in private national law, actually. So, um, so there is uh, something that goes in that, in that direction in the discussion we will have today. But first, let me uh, thank uh, uh, the organizers of this, in particular my friend Alvarez Rubio for inviting me to this, uh, uh, to this um, very interesting uh, um, uh, conference on uh, uh, business and, uh, and, and human rights. Um, I will try, in the limited time I have, to um, put some questions more than give answers, because I believe the, the current situation, uh, legal situation, and uh, not only legal, even a soft law situation, uh, does not allow to give many, many answers, final answers at least. And some depend, of course, uh, on the cases we will be discussing maybe more in detail, but I have to make reference to them in order to, uh, to put the questions I, I want to put for the, for the discussion. Uh, first, uh, as we are uh, in the field uh, uh, of uh, judicial remedies, for uh, um, protection of human rights, and I will not speak of non-judicial remedies because I think this is uh, other panels will, will have dealt and will deal with this um, with this matter. Um, uh, I would like to draw, without going into details, uh, your attention to the uh, principles uh, that have been adopted by the uh, in 2011 by the Human Rights Council on. Uh, um, on uh, uh, the issue of human rights and transnational corporations and other business enterprises. These principles are not the law, of course, are an assessment, however, of practices that may be taken into account. 
as uh, uh, these are principles adopted by the UN body, um, they are drafted in a way that leaves quite a lot of margins of interpretation. Uh, first, uh, they don't put obligations. They are drafted as principle, always with the word should, and never with a must, even when they speak of state's obligation that could, uh, could require a, a must, and not a shall, and not a should. But, uh, um, but that's the way of drafting a, a prudent document like, uh, a, like uh, principles by the Human Rights Council. But on that, uh, as far as judicial remedies are concerned, I would like to draw your attention in particular to principles, I don't know whether you have them, 25 and 26. 25 uh, explaining that uh, uh, states under the obligation to uh, uh, control the activity of corporations and avoid, uh, through judicial and non-judicial means, uh, or legislative means, that uh, abuses are not uh, carried out uh, in the territory or <clears throat> under the jurisdiction, within the jurisdiction of the state. Um, in, uh, by corporations, uh, well, conducting their, uh, their business. <clears throat> and uh, it refers to within the jurisdiction or on the territory. So it's clear, the fundamental principle is clear. However, when you come to the following provision, uh, principle 26, it uh, refers to appropriate steps to be taken by states to ensure the effectiveness of judicial mechanism when addressing business-related human rights abuses, including considering ways to reduce legal, practical, and other relevant barriers that could lead to a denial of access to remedy. So the, the accent is put on access to remedy. The main point is whether uh, victims of abuses are entitled to uh, bring a case before a court for, uh, for remedy. And the special rapporteur, when uh, commenting on this provision, uh, adds a, a comment saying that uh, it would be appropriate, one of these barriers is where claimants face a denial of justice in a whole state and cannot access home state courts regardless of the merits of the case. So the special rapporteur probably accepted the uh, general approach that was to limit the jurisdiction, but he himself was the idea that one should go beyond and, uh, uh, and uh, eliminate barriers to, the, to access to justice, even when the abuses occur outside of the, of the state. That's just to show that uh, in the document, uh, we should not use it uh, too strictly and uh, take into account that probably it's a sort of compromise that was made by, by, um, by the states, because the Human Rights Council is a, is a council of states. So to agree on something is not, is not very easy. It's already a miracle, I think, that principles like that have been adopted and endorsed by the Human Rights Council. Now, uh, why I said that? Because uh, uh, the main, one of the main issues we have in front of us is to discuss how far victims, alleged victims of violation, can bring a case uh, in a court of state A against a corporation when that corporation has uh, uh, committed crimes or responsible for abuses human rights abuses in a different country, in another state. And uh, there is, uh, in principle, no real connection with the states where the abuses have been committed um, uh, and the country uh, where the court uh, uh, sits. Uh, of course, there may be a general connection, which is the presence of the corporation in the country or a subsidiary of the corporation, or a part of the, uh, one of the many branches of the corporation in the country. But is that sufficient to base jurisdiction? And can jurisdiction be based um, 
uh, in a country, in, or the country of the court uh, sued, um, the court uh, approach, even if uh, there is no such contact at all. And you have simply a claimant bringing a, an action and bringing a case for a reparation of these violations by the corporation, and there is no link. Of course, you would need normally at least uh, the presence of uh, assets of the corporation, because otherwise a claim doesn't make sense, and no, nobody will bring a claim against a corporation that, where you cannot then enforce. Or, but that may be even the case, because there may be there may be treaties that allow for enforcement in other countries automatically. It's not, it's not excluded completely. But can we have jurisdiction when there is no contact? Now, the, um, the, the cases we, we have to discuss uh, today have uh, approached this problem. And uh, they come, this jurisprudence comes from the United States, essentially, because there was, as of the 18th century in the United States, a rule, a rule, the Alien Tort Act, or the statute, um, where it said that the district court shall have original jurisdiction in any civil action by an alien for a tort, uh, only for torts, not conducts, committed in violation of the law of nations or a treaty of the U.S. That means that jurisdiction was based only on the fact that uh, a, a, an abuse was in violation either of a treaty, but more generally of uh, the law of nations, so maybe customer international law. So any abuse could be brought in principle under this provision, and indeed, the, um, <clears throat> after uh, what, one century where the, this, uh, or more, more than one century, almost two centuries, where this provision remains dormant, once a case was brought against uh, a, a person for crimes committed in a South American country. And uh, the fact is that uh, the, uh, this was not a case against the corporation, however, it was a case against the individual. But uh, the, the court in the Philartica uh, case indeed endorsed this approach. There was general jurisdiction on this, simply based on that. Then they start with the restrictions. And the restriction concerns corporations, essentially, not individuals. There is no really individuals who have problems. And there are two main restrictions, I think, that are important. Maybe many other aspects, but uh, we refer to two. One is the restriction that uh, jurisdiction could be based on this rule only uh, if uh, we are dealing with most serious violations recognized universally by international law. And that was the Sosa case that established that, uh, that uh, in 2004, established this. And then we have the case we discussed today, the Kiobel case. The Kiobel case where uh, the, the court, the Supreme Court, put a, an additional restriction. And so that's very important for corporations because uh, it said essentially that in fact jurisdiction exists only if there is a nexus with the United States. But what nexus? A nexus concerning the tort. So part of the activity, of the illegal activity, must have been either committed in the United States or be strictly connected with the United States. It's left a bit open, this, this possibility. But essentially, uh, in, in the case at hand, it is said that part of the, the activity, of the legal activity, must have been carried out in the United States. So there is a, a nexus which is uh, stronger. There was a nexus in the case because the plaintiffs were resident in the United States. But uh, as you probably know, uh, in the United States law, the uh, the residence of the of domicile of the plaintiff plays no role in jurisdiction, in establishing jurisdiction. There is a, contrary to any principle of uh, US law 
to retain jurisdiction on, um, on, uh, uh, the, on the plaintiff's residence or, uh, or domicile. So um, the court spoke of a presumption of not extraterritoriality of the law, so the, the old law could not act in an extraterritorial way. There must be a territorial link with the, uh, with the, um, with the state. Of course, there was a subsidiary of the, of the company in, uh, in uh, or the sued company in, uh, the, in the United States. So that general jurisdiction existed, but that was not sufficient according to the court. It was a split decision that uh, went uh, five, to four to five to four, I think exactly it was five to four, and the minority challenged essentially the existence of the presumption of extraterritorial, of the territoriality of the, of, uh, of the law. Um, uh, but be as it is, this was, uh, um, this was the, the decision. Does this impact on, the, and how does this impact on the principle of universal jurisdiction when you have a human rights violation? Uh, the court does not say that, but uh, in fact it does. In fact it does because if you say that you need another link, it's no more universal jurisdiction. There must be, there is another uh, restriction. So um, uh, universal jurisdiction is allowed only if there are links in the, in the, forum, in the forum states, which is a, 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 big, a big restriction, a great restriction as compared with the Philartica case, for instance. Uh, now, my questions are the following. Is a restriction of this kind justified when a serious violation of human rights recognized internationally by human rights law are at issue? And that's a real question, a real question. But I, uh, because uh, accepting, I don't answer completely the, 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 the question. I don't think we have an answer, a complete answer now. But uh, by accepting this view, this restriction, are not the US courts permitting foreign multilateral corporations to do business in the United States provided they act correctly in the United States, although they misbehave abroad, is there not a link that is difficult, to, that should not that provide a nexus? Because in fact, allowing companies to escape jurisdiction for the violations abroad, uh, in a way, are we covering uh, these violations when profit may be made out of this violation that can help the business in the United States? Well, that's, that's the question uh, that I want uh, to, put, uh, to put to you. Interestingly, in the case, there were amicus curiae briefs. And uh, what, I don't go through all of them, but just to put, uh, uh, just to put the accent on two of them, one is the European Commission brief. European Commission brief was with the respondents, essentially, said, well, you should not allow jurisdiction in this, in this case. Uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction should not, uh, should not be uh, recognized or should be recognized maybe only in cases of international crime such as torture, or genocide. Well, it's very restricted, the idea. But, I mean, international <laughs> crimes is one thing. Torture and genocide, of course, are international crimes, but the list of international crimes is enough to look at the statute of the International Criminal Court is long from here to there. So are all the cases in which the crime recognized under the ICC statute would just the position of the Commission is not very clear in this, uh, in this uh, uh, respect. Um, uh, and then it is justified to limit universal jurisdiction only to violation we constitute criminal abuses under international law. 
uh, if the problem, and I go back to the beginning, is access to justice, are you limiting access to justice to crimes when there is a violation constituting a crime in international law, or the problem of access to justice is a general problem? Is a human right that should be ensured in any situation? I mean, when there is a, when there is a denial of justice in another country. And uh, strangely enough, uh, after a few years, the commission changed uh, its view. Because in fact, uh, in proposing the request of the Brussels regulation, <coughs> inserted the possibility of a forum necessitatis in any case in which access to justice was not recognized in a foreign country. This was rejected by the European Parliament, but the Commission took that position, and rightly so, probably. So there is some contradiction in the position, in the European position. Um, the other case is Germany. Germany made, uh, uh, presented a case again in favor of the respondents, but went a bit further, because uh, uh, took a position in which uh, it said that uh, jurisdiction should be allowed where there is no possibility for the foreign plaintiffs to pursue the matter in another jurisdiction with a greater nexus. Now, what does this mean? That uh, is the, rightly the German uh, brief uh, refers to the access to justice. When there is a possibility of denial of justice, we have jurisdiction. But it says with a greater nexus. You need greater means there must be some nexus or not. This is not very clear in the position of Germany. It's, uh, it would go in the direction of the, uh, the recast of Brussels, but with some, with some, uh, with some hesitation. Um, well, this is the situation outside, but what is the EU doing in the same case? What would the EU do? Uh, if you look at the current legislation, the harmonized legislation it concerns only uh, defendants domiciled in the country. And if a company is domiciled in the European Union, there is jurisdiction. But in torts, you have jurisdiction I, either at the place of, uh, uh, of uh, um, the, the, the damage or at the place of the harmful act. So this part is excluded, but under the general clause of jurisdiction, can you go beyond? Possibly yes, but uh, it's not very well, very well done. Certainly when, uh, when uh, corporations are outside of the union, the union has not taken a position. But states can do whatever they want. So they could, uh, in their legislation, adopt uh, different, uh, different uh, approaches. And I conclude uh, with a reference, because I think my time has gone, uh, with a reference to the position, again contradictory in a way, taken by the United States. Because when uh, in The Hague, Catherine knows very well, um, we were discussing a project for a worldwide convention on uh, jurisdiction and judgment in civil and commercial matters, the question of the human rights violation was raised by the United States delegation, who came to the conclusion and even said very clearly, we will not accept any treaty in which an exception from the prohibited grounds of jurisdiction were not made in cases of human rights violation, which is in clear-cut contradiction with the position taken later by the Supreme Court. What is now the position of the US administration? I do not know, but certainly we are in a situation in which uh, uh, all what we have in front of us raises more questions than, than answers, unless we can find the answers here in this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Pokar, for that very interesting uh, view on, in fact, uh, the cases that we will be discussing uh, later a little bit more as well. Um, 
I think you raise a number of, of very intricate and also very interesting points. And, and one of the main points, um, uh, as, as a general point, is, is I think a very valid question. If, as a country, you have comp companies operating uh, on your soil, um, so you have the benefits of those companies undertaking economic activities within your territory, should you not then also step up and assume jurisdiction if those same companies or companies within the same group um, um, cause damage to people and planet in, in third countries? So that's, a, a, I think, a very general point that you make that is a very valid um, a question also to put to the audience just now. Um, if you will allow me, I, I would just uh, have your um, uh, thoughts on one other brief uh, that was also submitted in the Kiobel case. And this brief was submitted by the, the, the Dutch and the English governments uh, together. And they actually said, I mean, obviously in the Kiobel case, it was uh, uh, Shell, uh, the case against Shell. Shell is an Anglo-Dutch company. company yeah. yeah, so the English and Dutch governments obviously had a huge stake in this case. And they also wrote a brief to the Supreme Court saying, and they were, they were you know, much stricter than uh, the European Commission. They were very strict, actually. They said, if you assume jurisdiction in this case, that is a violation of public international law, because that is a violation of sovereignty. They didn't say whose sovereignty. I'm not clear, because they were, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying also I agree with the brief, but this is what they said. They says, this is a violation of sovereignty of the other states involved. I assume they meant Nigeria, unless they were saying that it was their sovereignty because they wanted to litigate mm. this case, but I don't think that's what they wanted to say. So I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, yes, I can give you my thoughts on that. I didn't mention the Dutch, uh, the Dutch uh, um, uh, British uh, brief uh, because I don't think it's uh, really reliable in this case because there were parties. In a way, it is, a, as you said, it's a Dutch, a Dutch a British corporation, so they had an interest, a clear interest, and I believe the brief is dictated by the interest. I don't think there is a violation of any sovereign, uh, sovereign uh, prerogatives of other countries. Uh, we have to bear in mind that under international law, strictly speaking, a country may exercise jurisdiction whenever that country wants. There is no limit, except if there are international rules prohibiting. But I don't see any rule at the moment in the world. We, the, we are still at uh, the position taken correctly by the Permanent Court of International Justice in, 27, in 1927 in the Lotus case, where the court clearly said that uh, under international law, there is no restriction to grounds for jurisdiction used by state A or B, unless there is a prohibitive rule uh, of international law, which is essentially rules of immunities. Now, of course, if the case were brought against another state, the problem might be a problem of immunities, might be. It's still to be discussed, the international Court of Justice recently decided in a case against the state, that's Italy versus Germany, for crimes committed by the Nazi, but of course Italy was acting in diplomatic protection, essentially, of Italians that had brought the case. Uh, immunity will come into play, and there are immunities, so there is no case. Uh, Germany will have no case to answer. That's the position of the ICJ. This is, remains within the framework of the Lotus case. If there is a rule of immunity, the problem is whether when you have uh, international crimes, the rule of immunity should prevail over other rules. But that's a different, uh, a different question, of course. So everybody may have his, uh, his views on that. But I don't think the, the brief of, uh, of the Netherlands and, uh, and uh, Britain was, uh, was really to the point, actually. Yeah, thank Sorry. you. Yeah, Sorry, no, 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 you're not offending me at all. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, just, uh, I think what is really interesting, and after just making this one remark, I'll open up to the rest of the panel and the audience. I think what's really interesting is that the, the Dutch English brief shows in these cases, um, um, I mean, the, the Kiobel case was really the poster child case for trade interests versus human rights interests, and obviously the brief of the governments was motivated by trade interests, by protecting their own. 
And, um, and, and I think that is, that is one of the issues that really became really clear in this case. And what also became really clear is how, the, uh, how, how because this is a civil case, it's a, it's yeah. a case between two private parties, between uh, sure. individuals and a company. So usually governments would not mind too much about these types of cases, leave it to the field of private international law to be dealt with. And in this case, all of a sudden, all these governments start interfering. So it shows us also how, how high profile these civil liability cases against multinationals uh, may be. Mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think there is a, an approach uh, of uh, states, uh, uh, sort of, uh, but that's in general, a uh, sort of concern not to disturb other countries. It's not a question of sovereignty or not, but not to disturb the business, because it's clear that if uh, one uh, country interferes, then the others will interfere too. So they, and probably this is what motivated the withdrawal I mean, or the position of the Parliament, the European Parliament, in not letting the, the Brussels uh, uh, proposal of the Commission going on, to the concern that uh, in international relations is better to keep, uh, to keep quiet. But this, uh, this, of course, leaves the companies to do what they want and to disregard human rights. So that's the consequence. Um, I would now really um, give everyone the opportunity, perhaps Mr. Corta, I'm not sure if you, um, this is very technical, legal and um, story, so I don't know if you want to react, otherwise maybe there are questions also from the audience and I'm sure there will be some questions directed at you as well. So, uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon to everybody, uh, thank you for Global Month to, for invitation to be here. So really, I, I'm not familiar with all these laws, so I, I will do my best to do my, uh, my, my opinion. Uh, but let's say that I am coming from uh, SME, and my company is a family company, and not very related to these multinational companies. So we, we, we face all these things about multinationals a little bit uh, far from us, so it's not, not related to us. So that's, that's, our, that's the first point I think like to uh, t be, be clear on that. And um, that's, that's the only thing that I would like to say yes for, for the beginning. So I don't want to go further that night. So I prefer to go for, for questions and let's uh, Does anyone from the audience have any questions perhaps? I'm sure, yeah. So Catherine Kassidjian from Paris. Um, Judge Pokar uh, alluded to it, but I would like to insist on a point um, uh, which has a, uh, also kind of a ripple effect in, uh, with the remedy, for the, with the third pillar of the Ruggi principles. And this is, um, and I, I'm just putting some more construction of what you said. You said that basically in Europe, member states of the European Union have the power presently, as European law stands, to do more than what European law does. And this is a very important point, which is most of the time misunderstood by member states themselves. And this is the difference between applicable law and jurisdiction. In jurisdiction, member states can do better, and some have the tools to do better. And some states, and I, actually I, I have a hard time finding the exact information on how many states do have uh, that rule. But uh, I am speaking now, for those of you who are not entirely familiar with European law, I'm speaking about Article 6.1 of the Brussels Regulation, which basically says, and, and in, the, in the recast, in the new regulation, it's Article 8.1. It has changed numbers, so it makes things a bit more complicated. But this is a rule which allows a court to take jurisdiction on a number of defendants, co-defendants in the same claim. And I'm thinking, of course, of Dutch Shell, mother company in the Netherlands, and the Nigerian uh, subsidiary in Nigeria. So let's imagine that we have the Kiobel case, but instead of being in before the US courts, it is before a European court. 
if that were in France, we do have such a rule in our common law, which means that if you want to sue Total, French mother company, in French courts, plus its subsidiary outside the EU who has committed, no, of course, they would never have committed anything, but this is just as hypothetical, something outside the European Union, then France would take the jurisdiction on both com companies. And in fact, the, yeah, the, <laughs> I see your hesitation. The, the one aspect which is still discussed in practice is do you need to show for jurisdiction purposes a link? And I am saying no. You need to show a link later on when you are dealing, when the court is dealing with the liability but not at the jurisdictional level. And I think we have a duty in doctrine to insist on that point, and nobody does. So I'm really concerned, and I would like to hear Professor Pokar on this. I don't know, it may be wrong, of course, in, um, in assessing the law, but uh, the principle of the 6-1, or eight today, you apply with the defendant in the union yes. and the other also in the union. Yeah. But I'm speaking of the French rule, the equivalent ah. in French law of six months. Ah, doing the equivalent. Doing the equivalent, of course, you could, you could do it. But my point was, do you agree with me that you do not need to show... I think the, at the moment of jurisdiction, you don't have. It's a question of merits, in my view. Okay. On the merits, yeah, you have, uh, why you don't have a case? But you don't have to show you have a case at the moment of jurisdiction, prima facie at least. Uh. We have time for one other question before I turn to more um, description of the case. Is there any other question, any other, anyone else who would like to pose a question at this stage? Okay, in that case, yes, I see a question here, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Apokar. Um, do you think that the universal jurisdiction should be the right approach in some cases on business and human rights? I mean, the, the universal jurisdiction theory that, for example, in, in Spain we got uh, uh, with Baltasar Canzón and other judges uh, persecution, uh, human rights abuses, uh, throughout the un uh, universal jurisdiction doctrine, do you think that could be uh, uh, interpreted in the same way in, in some business cases? I think it could be a, a, a remedy, actually, that states could uh, provide in appropriate cases, because at the end, uh, it's universal and not because you normally would have, except the situation of enforcement in other countries that I mentioned earlier, but uh, um, normally you would have in any case a defendant in the country. So you are using universal jurisdiction as to the abuses committed in another country, but you have a general jurisdiction in any event over the corporation. So it's... Uh, Universal will be when you have no link whatsoever, but if you have the, the, the presence, it's already, it's like in criminal matters, if you have the defendant in the country, if you have the accused in the country, you have a link, in any case. If the violation is a violation of a, an international rule, uh, that could be enforced by anybody, like in criminal matters, why, why shouldn't I use it? I mean, it's, uh, the, the, the universal jurisdiction in criminal matter has not been invented by judges recently. It's uh, clearly stated in the Geneva Conventions of 1949. The Geneva Conventions are based on the doctrine of universal jurisdiction because they list each convention, the four conventions, a, a, a number of grave breaches of the conventions, and on these grave breaches, the states 
parties to the conventions, that is all the states essentially, have uh, uh, the obligation to exercise jurisdiction over criminals that are in their country, irrespective of whether they committed a crime. So that is clearly stated already uh, 60 years ago. It's not a, a, a recent invention. That states never applied it, that's a different issue. But uh, from the legal point of view, is, uh, is an opportunity they can use. And I would see no problem in exporting it to the question of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, business. Because at the end, when you have these in serious international violations, even restricting it to that, uh, I will go beyond, but even restricting to international violations, the important approach is that the violation of this kind should not be tolerated, should not be unpunished, and especially should not be the basis of profit because uh, that uh, should not be an exploitation of the violation in order to make, to, make, to make money. So I think it will be entirely justified. Um, I think there are many more interesting things to say about it, and I hope we'll get a chance to do that Maybe, um, yeah, no, just no, now. Um, hmm. I'll close the website. Yeah. We can't ah, there we go. There we go. Ah, so this is the two cases that we um, will also be discussing in this panel. And um, I mean, you've gotten a case description. This is quite um, um, intricate cases, both of them. Um, and what I would just like to do is just take a brief moment to just sort of sketch the broader context within which these two cases uh, played out, and um, I think uh, <laughs> Professor Pokar has actually really helped me because he already um, sketched some of the broader context. Um, what we are, have been seeing, what Western societies have been seeing over the past two decades is a trend towards, a growing trend towards transnational civil liability claims brought against multinational corporations in their home countries for harm caused to people and planet in developing host countries. Um, and these foreign direct liability cases, as I often like to call them, uh, are typically initiated by host country citizens uh, who often, with the help of NGOs, turn to these Western society courts in order to uh, get a, a more adequate level of protection of their human rights, their health and safety, and their local environment than they feel they can get um, in their own country or before their own courts. Um, and one of the key features of these cases, and there are many interesting features, but one of the key features is that the plaintiffs typically seek to hold accountable uh, not just the, the actors directly involved, so the local subsidiaries or the local subcontractors, but also the parent companies of the multinational corporations involved. And this, this, this raises a number of really interesting legal questions as well. Um, up until now, the far majority of these cases um, have been brought before U.S. federal courts on the basis of the alien tort statute that uh, Professor Pokar also spoke on just now. So this is an, an ancient U.S. statute. It dates back to 1789, and it was rediscovered in the 1980s by human rights activists um, who sort of found out that this sort of statute that had never really been used might provide a legal basis for civil claims before U.S. federal courts in relation to international human rights violations perpetrated anywhere in the world. Now at first, the claims that were brought, so the human rights activists started to, to use the statute, and at first the claims that they, that they brought were mostly targeted at individual perpetrators of human rights violations. But uh, from the mid-1990s onwards, um, 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 some really um, uh, clever lawyers decided, no, we might also try not just to, to put claims against individuals, but also against corporate entities. And so from the mid-1990s onwards, more and more claims on the basis of the ATS were brought before U.S. federal courts against multinational corporations doing business in uh, countries in Africa, Asia, um, South America, etc. Um, and one well-known example that I'm 
you might, have all, might all be aware of, apart from the two cases that we'll discuss just now, because these are two examples. Um, but one other example are the claims that were brought against a score of multinationals, including uh, Ford, General Motors, IBM, but also, for instance, the German uh, Rheinmetall Group, um, for their alleged involvement in the, in the human rights violations perpetrated by the South African apartheid regime. Now, the trend towards these cases has not remained confined to U.S. federal courts. Um, claims have also and increasingly been brought before U.S. state courts, but also before courts in other Western societies. And think of, think, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm just naming a few, Australia, Canada, the U.K., Sweden, and the Netherlands. Um, in the absence of an, an equivalent for this ATS uh, alien tort statute in these countries, um, these claims have usually been based on more general um, principles of tort law and the tort of negligence in particular. And uh, what is also interesting, an interesting difference, another difference is the focus of these cases that have been brought um, uh, not on the basis of the ATS have also not have this strong uh, focus on international human rights violations. Most of the cases brought outside the US have been about violations of the environment or violations of health and safety standards. Um, and I'll just name two very well-known examples. Uh, the one is the claim that are the claims against Trafigura that were brought before the High Court in London uh, by victims of the Probo Koala toxic waste dumping incident in the Ivory Coast. And the other example, of course, uh, are the claims that are currently pending before the The Hague Court of Appeals against Shell in relation to damage caused by oil, oil spills from Shell-operated pipelines in uh, the Nigerian Niger Delta. Now, these foreign direct liability cases, these civil claims, these transnational civil claims, potentially play an, a crucial role in exploring the hard law edges of soft law instruments like the UN Framework on Business and Human Rights. And um, as Professor Pokar rightly pointed out just now, this is a soft law instrument that um, obviously is, is very important but may, may not work as well when we're dealing with corporate laggards, um, corporations that do not take their responsibilities uh, when it comes to, uh, pr you know, um, respecting the human rights of people in third countries as seriously as some other companies. Um, but in order for these cases to play a role in this context, um, obviously it's very important is the feasibility, the legal feasibility of bringing these claims. And this legal feasibility of bringing these claims is mainly determined by four factors. Um, the first factor is whether the home country court, uh, where the matter is brought, has jurisdiction to hear the claim. Uh, the second question is, does um, uh, which national system of tort law will the court, if it has jurisdiction, will it apply in determining the validity of the claims? Um, the third factor that's very important is what are the conditions for liability that are connected to the legal basis upon which the case is brought. And then the fourth and perhaps most important factor um, in the potential success of these cases are um, to what extent are the practical and procedural circumstances in the forum country uh, conducive to this type of litigation. Now, um, obviously, and this is where we turn to the cases, um, up until recently, there were two main reasons for bringing, for, for the fact that most of the cases so far have been brought in the United States. Um, one or maybe three. One of them was the alien tort statute with which it all began and which created a, a, a certain precedent for these types of cases. The second one is the fact that up until recently, uh, US courts were relatively liberal in ATS-based foreign direct liability cases in assuming jurisdiction over these cases. And the third reason, obviously, is the fact that practical and procedural circumstances in the EU tend to be, uh, sorry, in the US, tend to be much more conducive to this type of litigation than um, um, are the practices in uh, EU member states. Um, having said this, um, I would like to turn now, and very briefly, because I would like to leave some room for discussion, very briefly to the two cases um, in front of us. And this is the slide that we're going to keep right. Yeah. So the first case is the Kiobel uh, versus Royal Dutch Petroleum case. And this was a case against Shell, basically, um, that was brought by um, a number of Nigerians in relation to um, Shell's alleged involvement in human rights violations perpetrated by the Nigerian military government in the 1990s. 
And uh, the, uh, the Nigerian uh, military government at that time was uh, cracking down on a number of environmental activists who were protesting against um, the environmental degradation uh, in the Ogoni land region of the Niger Delta caused by oil exploration activities there. Um, and uh, serious human rights violations were perpetrated in that context. And um, obviously there was a problem to sort of sue the Nigerian government, um, at least in Nigeria and in other countries as well. So what happened is uh, these, case, the, 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 these events caused international outrage, but they also caused civil claims being brought in the US against Shell, which was alleged of having aided and abetted the human rights violations perpetrated by the Nigerian government. And these claims were based on uh, the alien tort statute. Um, and two separate cases were brought, and the Kiobo case is one of, is, 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 is the later case. And in the Kiobo, the, the former case uh, was the Wiwa versus Shell case, and that was actually settled out of court in 2009. But the Kiobo case carried on, and um, some really interesting uh, sort of legal precedents were set in the Kiobo case. Um, at some point, um, the case went up to the second, uh, the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. And, that court came with a, issued a verdict in which it basically raised a question that had never been raised in that way before in any of the cases brought against multinationals based on the alien tort statute. And the, the, the appeals court said, um, can a case even be brought against corporate defendants on the basis of this statute? Because according to the appeals court, um, corporate liability has not been uh, universally recognized in public international law. This is what the appeals court said. So the appeals court said, throw out this case because you cannot bring claims against multinationals on the basis of this statute. Well, that was obviously, I mean, that was a big thing because that would have meant no corporate ATS cases anymore in relation to human rights violations. Uh, so the plaintiffs appealed and um, the Supreme Court granted uh, cert in this case. What was interesting is that so the Supreme Court was supposed to say something about the question of corporate liability under the Alien Tort Statute. Well, the Supreme Court in March 2012 said, well, that's a very interesting question, but I think there's a more interesting question. And that question is, what is this case doing in a US court? We're dealing with a case against an Anglo-Dutch company. The case is being brought by Nigerians, and the case is being brought in relation to human rights violations that have taken place in Nigeria. So why are we even involved in this case? So the Supreme Court basically raised um, the question of the, um, uh, the international reach of the alien tort statute. Um, and um, it raised that question, the parties briefed the court, there were lots of amicus briefs, we heard about that, and in the end, uh, the Supreme Court decided that um, um, this bringing cases like these, which have very little context with the contact points with the US legal order, are actually uh, barred by the US presumption against extraterritoriality. Um, and it basically held that uh, the ATS can only be used as a legal basis for claims um, relating to norm violations that have uh, occurred within the United States. So clearly, in most of these cases, that is not the case, because in most of these cases, it is really about norm violations, human rights violations, perpetrated in third countries, in developing host countries. Um, I think for this, I'll, I'll leave it at that for the Cuba case, because you've already said a lot about that. Then, turning to the, to the other case, to the Daimler case, um, so... These are both cases about jurisdiction, but the difference between them is that the, um, the Kiobel case was the, the question about the ATS, how do we interpret the ATS? The Alien Tort Statute is a statute of uh, subject matter jurisdiction. It's basically a statute that says when can the federal U.S. courts get involved? So this also has something to do with the U.S. federal systems. When can the U.S. federal system, when can the U.S. federal courts uh, say something about these cases? And the result of the Kiobo case was that in a very limited number of cases, at least when we're talking about cases against multinationals um, for violations in third countries. Um, but there was also another matter, and this matter was never really um, picked up in the Kiobo case, because the Kiobo case was all, all about how do we interpret the Alien Tort Statute. What it didn't 
uh, deal with was the question of personal jurisdiction, which is a different, it, it's a different question. It's a question under what circumstances can a court in the US, any court or a court in another country, assume jurisdiction over a particular claim against a particular defendant for particular activities that have connections also to other states. And um, interestingly, this is where the Daimler case comes in, which was decided also by the Supreme Court after the Kiobo case. And the Daimler case was about um, uh, also a, a sort of similar um, 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 uh, complaint um, of um, uh, complicity of Daimler, a German company, in human rights violations uh, perpetrated in Argentina during uh, the Dirty War. Um, and um, this case was brought in the US. Daimler is a, a German company. It was brought in the US um, because Daimler has a subsidiary in the US. This subsidiary was not the one who allegedly perpetrated the human rights violations in Argentina. That was an Argentinian, Argentinian subsidiary. Um, so this case really was all about, wasn't about the ATS anymore, it was all about personal jurisdiction under what circumstances can courts assume personal jurisdiction over these types of cases. And this is, so it has a broader scope, but this is because this is not anymore only about ATS-based cases, it's also about state cases, cases against multinationals brought before US state courts uh, on the basis of general principles of tort law, because there also the question of personal jurisdiction would arise. Um, and in this case, what happened, and I'll keep that very brief because it's very technical, but we can go in it much deeper if, if, if anyone in the audience wants this. But what happened in the Daimler case is basically that the, the US Supreme Court in that case then um, really narrowed the scope of personal jurisdiction of US courts. Before, like I said, per, uh, jurisdiction um, uh, used to be one of the reasons also for bringing these cases in the US. Rules on personal jurisdiction used to be a little bit more liberal than they are in the European Union. Now, with the Daimler case, what actually happened is that the personal jurisdiction, those liberal personal jurisdiction rules in the US have been narrowed, actually, I think, to, to, to a situation that is very similar uh, as the one in the European Union, meaning that a court will assume jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, in a case uh, if the defendant is domiciled within uh, the US state uh, where uh, the case is brought, or if uh, the harmful activities, the harmful conduct has uh, taken place uh, on the territory of that state. Um, this is where I would want to leave it for my introduction in these two cases. I think they raise really interesting questions and, and, and what I think is the most interesting question is, obviously these are two cases that greatly narrow down the perspectives uh, for bringing these types of suits before US courts, although it is obviously still possible. Um, but it also means that we may see more of these cases before non-US courts, meaning also in the EU member states. And considering the fact that we have a nice Spanish audience today, I haven't seen any Spanish cases, but I would be really interested to hear if you see any prospects for cases being brought in Spain, for instance. And th but this is just my question to you, and I suppose maybe you have also questions to us, so I would like to invite you to ask us any questions that you want or enter into discussion on these matters. Well, that cannot be, that cannot be possible, <laughs> unless, it is, uh, unless it is so complicated that it's really difficult. But I mean, as, as far as I'm aware, there are no cases at present in Spain. So to kick this off then, at least, um, it's, a, it's a comment that tries to uh, bring certain things together that, that, that have already been discussed by the panel uh, in the relationship between public and private international law. Um, one of the things that w were mentioned is that in the Kyobel context is that there's a potential concern here with um, U.S. courts adjudicating these cases, interfering in through the internal affairs of other states, right? So there's a potential concern with um, state sovereignty. Um, to complement this or to, to, to look at this from the other, from, from the other side, I, I would like to go back to something that uh, Professor Pocas said in the very beginning about 
uh, international human rights law is public international law and the duty to provide remedies, right? And the question of extraterritorial jurisdiction as a matter of public international human rights law. Because there the question that arises is that whether what obligations the state has towards third country nationals, if any. And if we accept that there are those, these obligations, as for example more recently suggested by various of the UN treaty bodies, then these obligations would include obligations to provide remedies, i.e. to have, um, among other things, uh, uh, a civil procedure and jurisdiction rules and private law, private international law that enable third uh, country nationals to bring these cases. Um, a pertinent example is when the UK um, reformed their rules on legal aid. There was a concern raised that this would make it more difficult for third country nationals in the business and human rights area to bring cases. And that was taken up by, I believe it was the Committee on, um, um, uh, on the Convention Against Racial Discrimination that said, well, the UK should make sure that it has a judicial system um, that enables third country nationals to bring claims against multinationals uh, that are incorporated in the UK jurisdiction. And this is, to emphasize the point again, a matter of public international human rights law. Right? So the question what human rights obligations the state of the United Kingdom has as a matter of international law. Just to complement a bit on what you've already said. Thank you. Well, actually... Thank you for your comment. I was actually, it, it inspired another question in me, but because you're, yeah, obviously this is about international human rights norms, um, but we're talking about enforcement in, uh, in, in, in national states, right? Because we, at, at present, we still, in this international legal order was said this morning as well, where the main paradigm is that of sovereignty, um, and we don't have any uh, treaty um, bodies actually capable or able to deal with these cases, right? There are no possibilities. And, and so this is actually something I would really ask to, uh, like to ask Professor Pokar. Um, we're seeing two cases here about human rights violations, perhaps even international crimes. And so they're brought on the basis of tort law before national courts. Obviously, that's the second best solution, because that's why we get this whole discussion over jurisdiction or not. Um, and I was wondering, if, do you see a role in the, in the near future or the more distant future for international uh, civil or international criminal tribunals or um, the bodies under um, uh, had other international uh, treaty bodies uh, to deal with cases such as these? Well, I do not know because the, the human rights system is based on the violation of states. So that's the only the only defendant possible is the state before before a human rights body and the human rights court, even the Strasbourg system. I mean, the, the defendant is the state. The plaintiff may be a company, but the defendant must be a state. So that's uh, um, the, all the enforcement is based on that. Of course, it could be changed, but it needs to be it needs to be changed as to criminal. Uh, all the current. Uh, Courts, whether ad hoc or uh, or the International Criminal Court statute provides for individual criminal responsibility only. So only individuals can be brought before the court, no, not corporations, uh, even if they commit crimes. But of course, the 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 representative of the corporation could be brought before a court, being responsible for the for the violations of of the company. But it should be himself to be, to be brought before the court. Uh, I don't think there has been any attempt to, to change the, the situation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the only case uh, I know of a criminal, um, uh, of a criminal case uh, against a, a corporation, against a company, is in the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. But it's not on the main jurisdiction. It's on uh, uh, a contempt case uh, where a company uh, allegedly committed uh, uh, a media company uh, or 
diffused, the documents should not have been diffused. So it was a contempt case, a contempt of court case, and the indictment went against the company. And there was a big debate inside was the jurisdiction was restricted to individual responsibility or corporate responsibility could also come into play. And of course, it's a different case where uh, uh, it's not the crime that's been committed. It's a different. It's a different situation. It's an ordinary crime. Contempt is not a, a crime. Uh, a crime against humanity as such. So, um, but that's the only case in which the tribunal is not yet has not taken a position because there is a. There are two cases. Uh, the first instance went. Uh, in the sense of excluding jurisdiction against corporation, the appeal went in favor. But in the second case, the first instance insisted, and the appeal has not come out uh, yet. So maybe they will change because the panel is changing. So uh, they may take a different position. Okay. I don't know. I would just, yeah. I would just like to ask the audience if there is any questions for Mr. Korda, and if not from the audience, I have a question. Can I ask my question? Yeah, okay, politics. great. Because this is obviously, I mean, this is a difficult panel for you to be in because uh, you, you have a s small to medium sized uh, enterprise, is that correct? Yes. Um, and so we were talking before, and you said, okay, well, you know, we just produce in Spain. Uh, we, you have a certain project that you, that you produce, and you operate in Spain, right? So, and but then I asked on, and I said, okay, but who do you sell your screws to, and, 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 and how does that work? And, do you, and then the question becomes, because just to bring this back to the more general sort of business human rights, more general, less legal context, um, is this something that in your, in your, in your company, is, 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 is there awareness um, uh, of the fact, I mean, do you have any idea the, what the company that you sell the screws do, what they do with those screws? I mean, and as I asked you, I mean, do you know if they make tanks with the screws or do they make bombs? And is this something that you, do you feel pressure uh, from the government or, or maybe from international developments in this field to be aware of those, um, yeah, and what, what happens with your product? Yes, uh, as I told you, we are an SME, and what we feel is a big pressure because uh, we feel that we have a lot of laws, from all, all kinds of laws. We have uh, tax laws, we have labor laws, we have uh, uh, ecological laws. Today we heard from Commissioner that will be coming, personal data law will come in, and we are, they are making us afraid of us again, even one much more law for us. So sometimes the small and medium-sized companies will feel that we cannot concentrate in our job. So we, in Europe, we are over uh, regulation and the companies, small medium-sized companies cannot be overlooking all these extra regulations. And how we can manage a company with, since with 10 people, 20 people is the media of the average of the companies in Europe. How we can protect these companies and as, as I think that we already, we face that we'll have enough regulations, and I will say that we need more effective regulations. Maybe not more, but we need less, but more effective regulations. Uh, you give me an example, I think, I, I, can't, I cannot be aware of what they are doing my old customers. I have thousands of customers all around the world. I cannot know what they are doing with my, uh, with my product. Well, I can know is what I do with my, uh, with my products in my activity, but not my, uh, what my customers are doing around. This already is, is so, uh, so few regulations about the, well, you, you talk about tanks or whatever, uh, there is a double use regulation already in Europe, then already the companies are double checking about these double, uh, reg double use regulations, for example, and a lot of companies, they are suffering these double use regulations because they are over-focused and any products they are doing, this double check and it's over-checking of their activity and it's difficult to compete. How we compete with small, medium-sized companies all around the world? Okay, I think Umar rights are there, but how we can compete with Chinese or Americans or Russian companies? They are not respecting human rights anymore. I think my point of view is that 
European companies we must respect human rights in Europe as an example for the rest of the of the of the of the of the companies all around the world and when we travel in our uh, with our companies and with our business all around the world we must be like an example for the rest of the companies how we can they can uh, manage their companies uh, related to human rights so. your point and the difficulties that a small company has uh, however um, going back to the question that has been asked uh, shouldn't you take uh, make a sort of a due diligence uh, approach in looking where your product goes because uh, um, if your product may be used probably on for many things for yeah. many purposes yeah, yeah. But you never, never had a suspect, for instance, that one customer may use them for an illegal product. And you cooperate to, to that illegality. I say in your interest to yeah, make yeah. that because yes, yes. that would be in a case, you would be, you would be safe. Remember yeah, the yeah. case of uh, Nuremberg in which uh, the producer of gas sold the gas to the party, to the Nazis that was used in the camps for killing the detainees. And that was a case, I mean, a clear case. Of course, a seller of gas says gas for, for heating, but, but okay. Uh, if it was, and, and the case was, no, it's difficult, it's clearly difficult, of course, uh, not to uh, compare, but just, uh, yeah. just, to, make it, just to make an example. But the defense was based on the fact that we were asked and told that this was gas for heating. And in that case, could be could be a valid defense if you if you know that. If you don't know, uh, there is uh, rumors that it's used for different. Uh, you never had rumors of that it was uh, we always your product rumors. was used yeah, for other for, things. But for example, we should take to to um, Albert Einstein to the cards because of Hiroshima bomb. That's, so that's that's the thing. Well, so uh, I think that in that point. Uh, nobody's thinking about uh, putting the example Albert Einstein as a guilty or something, as homicide or whatever, but I think it looks like uh, companies are always, from the starting point, always are guilty. So as a starting no, no, no. point, so, as I'm, I'm not, not saying I'm that not this is your, that. I'm not saying, no, no, my I, position. no, no, as I say, it's not the position. I, I just, in general, I mean, that comparing with the same uh, situations, it's much easier to look like a guilty as a, to a company that any other field, I say I was testing, but I don't, it's not, I think it's not fair to be the comparison, but okay. No, I agree, I, I agree. I, oh, your question, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, why, why did you give, make me this question? <laughs> <laughs> it, it would have come anyway. So whether it was Lisbeth or somebody else in the I room. Was, I was waiting just to leave, so. <laughs> I must ask you to keep it brief I, I, because we I need to... I, yes. I am safe. Okay. Two things. Two things. Um, the one thing is um, you also have, I'm sorry, it's an, ad an addition into the, 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 the accountability that you have as a company, is to look at the source of the material. Where does the iron or whatever, acier, whatever you are using to... Um, uh, produce your screws are coming. You know, you have the blood diamond, and now I, I learned there is even blood chocolate. I, I'm a chocolate lover, and I'm terrified now at buying chocolate, not knowing where the chocolate comes from. But anyway, um, the second thing is, you are a member of an industry federation. Yeah. You have a trade union. You have um, a collective help. Why don't you use that collective help to do your human rights due diligence? They can help you doing that. It's not entirely on your shoulders, but you should use the collective strength of your federation to do this as a collective matter. And in addition, you also have the contractual means. Yes, sorry, Elizabeth. She, she's looking at me. She wants me to stop. 
Yeah, contractual. Uh, do you have human rights clauses in your orders, in your purchase orders, in, your, in the documents that your company are issuing? This is not difficult. This is voluntary. Okay, I think your final uh, word was the, the best point. It's voluntary. No, no, no. You are saying it's voluntary or not? Okay, but I didn't understand. But uh, first point, I didn't understand the first question. But the second one, I'm in the in the trade association in Europe for the machine tools. That's what we are trying to do, but we are not able to get close to the regulation people to ask them about our situation, and we are not getting the support from the regulation and from the politicians. So. Sorry about it. Mm -hmm. So we have different point of view. No, no, but I think this is, I, I, I actually like uh, ending on this note for this panel because it clearly shows sort of the contrast between our sort of legal ambitions and the ambitions of preventing human rights abuse, uh, remedying human rights abuse, and the practical problems that, you, that may corporations run into even when trying to do good, but it's really difficult to know what you should do to do good, right? Yeah. Um, on that note, I would like to ask you all to take uh, a couple of minutes, two, three minutes, to stretch your legs, um, get a breath of fresh air outside the, this room, and then come back for the next panel. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the panel as well. Thank you.